Hello, everybody. Welcome to Warp Taste Podcast. I'm Ryan Rex Rex, and we're here today with an awesome guest. I'm super stoked for this one. We have Matt Good from from first to last, and uh, maybe you probably know him from Kit Fisto, probably more likely. But from first to last is a pretty cool <laughs> band. Yeah, that seems pretty likely. What's <laughs> up? Hi, I'm Matt. Nice to be here. Awesome. And I have two great uh, co-hosts today that are doing a little special guest over here. If I can have you guys introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Izzy. Hi, Izzy. And you're in a cool <laughs> band, aren't you? Isn't there a cool yeah. band? Yeah. <laughs> Bury me with you, yeah. Awesome. We're yeah. playing with millionaires in like two weeks. <laughs> That's so that's cool. Love the Millionaires. Those are the homies. They were on the final Jordan Blake sound, uh, song with Richie Obelia and Love Millionaires. Millionaires is always awesome. Yeah. <laughs> good, luck. good luck. Break a leg on that show. That's Thank good. you. I'm like, I'm super nervous. It's my first time literally on stage ever. On and if you I'm weren't terrified. Nervous, if you weren't nervous, I'd say that there's something wrong. That's perfectly normal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we're playing with scary kids next, and that's e even crazier. And I'm, yeah, what? <laughs> Heck yeah, my my homies and not nearly are doing uh, guitar and bass for that, and they're doing backing vocals. They're uh, doing the scary kids stuff. I I love the new scary kids tour. Like, just yeah, it's awesome to be a part of that. It's really cool. It's, it feels so surreal. Like two years ago, I was just at like Kill Iconic, and I was like just watching in the crowd i was literally just there for them awesome and um uh, also joining us today hi <laughs> I, i'm trying to press the mute button okay so hi i'm evelyn i also um i'm known as kid bandit uh professional wrestler um also a video game nerd and big scene kid uh all pr proud of it so hi um Love the memes, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dude, you guys are like, speaking of memes, though, your guys' TikTok game is already off the charts, Matt. I'm digging, like, <laughs> Titan. like, what is that? Like, you guys are digging down deep. You're coming out shit posting guns a blazing. What's up? Well, like, you guys were, were ready for this comeback. Oh, yeah, of course. I, <clears throat> we, uh, I mean, Travis, it's a lot, Travis, but. He kind of got me. I have a different meme pipeline than Travis does, but he's he has like, yeah, check out these AI dance videos. And I was like, these are fucking awesome. And then I was like, hey, let's just put that on the TikTok and just see what happens. And we did. And it's not like viral or anything, but you know, it, it was funny. Uh I think we're probably just gonna do more because there's tons of those. I found another one the other day that was insane. And I was just like, I don't even know how far we can go with this. Like maybe sky's the limit. I guess we'll see. I'm not really sure though. Some of them get kind of weird, but I kind of I like it. I like the weird vibe. I feel like for first to last has always kind of had like an on the fringe kind of sense of humor to it. I mean, you guys spent the last four years having a a, a certain person as your uh, profile <laughs> picture, mm -hmm. and I feel like unless you're on Twitter like chronically like some folks, like some people don't understand like mm. what the deal with. Skeletor being your profile picture with and you know there's there's skepticism about whether it's like a meme a troll a reference or maybe it's just Travis is a really big He-Man fan and he wanted to share his He-Man fandom with us do you have any <laughs> light you can shed on that um I mean honestly <laughs> it's so funny with this band because this band, like, so many things that have come to become part of the lore of this band are things that we've just done because we're just like, yeah, that'd be funny. And, like, the amount of thought that was put into it was, like, less than an actual minute. And you're just like, yeah, yeah. Like, including Sonny being the singer. Like, <laughs> this thing goes way back. You know what I mean? Like, so, uh, yeah, the Skeletor thing was, like, we were just, like, I think Travis was like, yeah, I'm gonna make our thing Skeletor. And I was like, yeah, all right, cool. And that was the whole that was the whole thing. But then it just kind of like, I don't know, it kind of just like picked up with you guys, the like, you know, the fans that were still paying attention. And 
I think it's got a good vibe, and it does actually fit with the ribcage shirt pretty well, which is funny. I always thought that that's what it was a reference to because the original color, it's like, I, I got to move because my background has like the iconic logo. Yeah. Like the green is a very Skeletor like green. It is. I just never really noticed before. <laughs> like But you when know you. what? We can just invent the lore that the whole time the ribcage shirt has actually been Skeletor. It's like, Mm. it fits. And it's like the fact that fans can even create lore about something like that is just. I don't know. I feel like from first to last has always kind of like enabled that creativity, whether it be from an influential standpoint, whether it be sound or fashion, because I don't I'm pretty sure everybody was just copying the note to self music video for the first two years of MySpace, like 2004, 2005. Everybody just looked like y'all in their profile picture. uh yeah yeah that's really not that far off but i mean honestly you did touch on something real there the band i feel like is a very community oriented thing it, i don't know if like we necessarily made it like that on purpose but it just kind of organically evolved to be like that over the you know decades and uh And now I like, I mean, I like it a lot, but like, it's just one of those things, right? Like we've had different members and it's different eras where different people have come and gone and added like their flavor to the pot, you know, like there's, I like that about it. I think it's cool. I think like anything that's like a, a community oriented, like artistic project is bound to be more interesting most of the time. So I don't know. I feel like that's what we've kind of grown into and I'm a big fan. Hell yeah, dude. Like, I'm happy to be a part. I mean, one of the oldest Facebook groups I'm a part of is the FFTL Cult on Facebook. And Mm -hmm. it's it's not a giant group. It's a very, like, small fostered community of people that have experienced from first to last for, like, a majority of your guys' career. I mean, I think this is your 25th year as being a band. Because I think is it Wikipedia claims y'all formed in 1999. well uh let me think about that so i graduated in 2002 so That is sort of accurate. It depends on how loose you want to get with that. Because like when I was in high school, I was in first to last, which you may have seen that floating around. But uh, it was a pop punk band that was just a Blink-182 ripoff. And uh, it wasn't until about my senior year or yeah, about my senior year, I had met Travis. And he was in a different band called Eastdale. And we played together. And basically what happened was is that we were both like, we want to take this to the next level. And we saw commonality in each other, like drive. And I was like, damn, that guy wants it as bad as I do. And when I recognized that in Travis, I was like, I got to keep this guy close to me. And then we just both basically combined our bands and turned it into from first to last, like right about when I graduated. And I actually got kicked out of my house because, you know, there was this whole like domestic thing going on. And, uh, I went to live with Travis, like, I, I would say within a week of graduating, somewhere around there. And it just ever since then, we just were like, this is it. This is the only thing. So I think that was when I would say it started, probably. So I'd say, oh, two. We should probably amend that Wikipedia. <laughs> I mean, everyone who's anyone has heard first two last 2001 demo, the silent treatment. I mean, it's 10 minutes of just banger glory. But I mean, day by day, man, I, I can't start my day without it. But I think um, I think I have the hard copy in my closet in this room, actually. Wow. That's that's a piece of history. 2000 Yeah. demo came out. I don't know, man. I don't know if you can amend history. I think. every everything that involves from first to last involves the root and matt is kind of like matt good is good he rhymes with from first to last i think it's just like you put the idea and wheels in motion those all kind of just led to you getting there i mean but if you want to put 2002 i mean 20 what is that 22 years i mean 25 yeah is a nice round number though <laughs> yeah well it just depends on your point of view i mean you guys are so well versed in the in the at least you anyway are so well versed in the lore of like what kind of like fine details can i even bring to the table for your brain at this point <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Does anybody here know that Matt Good was in The Color of Violence in like 2003? Apparently, that's what YouTube told us. I was, yeah. Yeah. Um, That was... I did the, we did a tour. Really?
Yeah, and Derek's Toyota Corolla. Nice. Yeah, it was scary as shit. Is And that like, is uh, that like your first tour experience? no, No. um, but that tour was insane. We were just like, we had a singer, and uh, I think oh yeah, it was Travis. Travis is a singer, and then he didn't want to go on the tour, or couldn't go on the tour. I think because he was working at Hard Rock still at that point, and so basically he was like. Yeah, I can't go. And we we're just like, well, we're going to go anyway. So we just had First some book, guy. bro. Yeah, we just got some guy from Orlando who was in the scene who could scream and just said, hey, can you do this? And he's like, I've never heard the song. He's like, yeah, just make up whatever you want. Because like, you couldn't tell anyway. We're going So on tour, dude. That's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like it was like grindcore, like Color Violence Now does not sound like Color Violence Then. Color Violence Then was literally only blast beats and double bass with like discordant shit like it was insane Oh, yeah. And and I, I'm pretty sure, I don't know, I could look it up because there are demos that have surfaced from the color of violence. yeah And I don't know, are were you ever on those demos? yeah so Oh. like our our live show was just us like filling around and like hitting things and like we actually we did one show where we made everyone it was in the basement we made everyone leave so we could turn off all the lights and get naked and have them come back in But I think I think we ended up not doing it for some reason or another, but we thought it'd be funny. But like yeah, the tour is just like that. You know what I mean? Like it was just unhinged. Like we were like eating out of dumpsters from Panera and shit like that. Hey man, nothing wrong with a little dumpster diving if it means survival. Yeah, yeah. It was a good Yeah, time. so yeah, there is an EP on uh it's full, I mean it's about four minutes long. It says full EP, the winter 2003 winter tour CD. I'm sure that's probably a CD you guys were passing around. Yeah, uh huh. We had a hard copy, I'm sure. That that's online. Yes, that's on YouTube right now. It's uh B-side archive, obscure music and lost media. Has 281 views. It was uploaded a year ago. I'm gonna look that up. The color. What would you say is demo EP? It's the 2003 Winter Tour CD, Oh, okay. full Let EP me check. 2003. That should be enough keywords. There it is. Let's see if this is it. I don't think it'll play on your. Yep, this is it. <laughs> I can tell immediately. <laughs> I, yeah, even I used to be straight edge. Yep, that's so fucking funny, dude. <laughs> Amazing. That's crazy. And you weren't involved, but you were only involved like with that tour. You weren't on the Euthanize album that was released through Epitaph in 2009, no? No, I didn't. At that point in time, 2009, was I in drugs at that point? I think I was. I believe uh, Throne of the Wolves comes out in 2010, Oh, and okay, then no. you guys broke up shortly after that. I want to say that Drugs was 2011. Yeah, you're probably Oh, you right. guys, I saw you guys playing drugs in at the San Luis Obispo Brewery. Nice. Yeah, and great show, dude. Like, I think that's the last time I saw you live, to be honest with you. Uh, Yeah, huh? Makes yeah. sense. I haven't done a lot of live stuff since then. You miss it? Yeah, that's why we're doing live stuff again. Oh, I guess no one knows that yet, but yeah. <laughs> Oh. Whoopsie doodle. Oh. Yeah, but But I mean, I. I feel like it should be fairly obvious at this point. Like, I think anyone with at least a little bit of common sense and problem solving skills will see that, like, one of the main reasons we decided to start moving on without Sonny was so we could just do what we wanted, which includes playing. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? I'm sure you probably put that together in your head already. Maybe. I, you know, you never know with from first to last. You know, you don't know if they're going to. release a song and go on tour or take a six year hibernation. We don't, we're, we're, we're here trying to get answers and now we're getting them. And I think we're going to inform the audience that from first to last is going to be touring. Now. Whoa, Are whoa, you? whoa, I didn't say touring. I said we're Oh, playing live. Touring we're is, playing live. th th that's, that's way up in the air. That depends on a, on a bunch of factors. But there's uh, many opportunities that a band of our stature could take advantage of these days <laughs> that include playing live. Like, you know, festival circuit stuff, you know, like flyaway shows, things like that. Um, that is... way more in line with what we want to do a tour would just be contingent on a bunch of things you know how how the band grows from this point forward like through the beginning of next year what the demand is like you know if there's a tour we could do where it made sense with another band like you know like the used or something like that i always thought would be cool but yeah that this things like that would be the determining factors
That makes full sense to me. I mean, there's so many avenues now for bands that kind of have uh, been a part of the scene for a long while. There's So What Music Festival. There's When We Were Young and stuff like that. And it seems like you see a lot of bands coming back. I mean, you guys are in good company this year. Like a Static Lullaby came back, Reggie and the Full Effect for Furnace Fest. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be a cool feeling, not just for like, you, know, you, but for everyone else. It's kind of like summer camp because it's like there's opportunities to see old friends that you haven't seen in a very long time. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I was talking to Shane from Silver Scene and about that. And we were like reminiscing about all the old times. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll see you out there this year. And he's like, I'd love that. And I was like, yeah, me too. That'd be great. Like, If anyone, if you're watching this and you're enjoying what you see, go check out the lead singer syndrome with Matt. The new episode just came out. It's a great episode. They go over the Genesis track at the very end. You get to hear the whole track. If you haven't heard it yet, definitely check it out, though. That interview is really good. Good insight. Shane's really good at asking those hard hitting questions. Yeah, it was great. It was funny, too, because he was like, yeah, man, I had nothing prepared for this, but we talked the whole time. No problem. I was like, yeah, dude, of course. <laughs> it's easy when you're talking to like old friends and stuff like that. And say, like, I love this story about Travis helping him warm up in Prague or whatever. Doing it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. You gotta do if anyone wants to be better at singing, just do lip trills. It's it really it's operatic exercise for your lungs for expansion. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah, and also, like, all the new bands I've been recording, too, are all, like, fucking way into this shit, and they're, like, wanting to play. So I was like, yeah, man, that's fine with me. I'm down. You actually, um, have, you actually have, like, a very impressive, like, production catalog. Not only that, but you also have, like, a really cool feature catalog, because sometimes you do features for people that you work with, like Whitney Payton. Yeah. Uh, that was a cool... It was cool seeing you in that environment as well, like, just doing something different. And I always... Even with the new from first to last, it's kind of like that where you've always been kind of like experimental. It's like music's music. I'm not just trying to make Dear Diary 20 times in a row. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things about me being singing or me singing, not being singing. <laughs> me singing out the new song is because I have like um my my approach to music and production and writing and all that stuff is like I have like literally zero ego about it like there there are people that I record where I'm like damn that's a cool effect on your voice and I'm like yeah but like it doesn't sound like me and it's like what I mean it's kind of the point but yeah I see what you're saying you know like they have like this really weird thing in their head where it's like if it doesn't sound like them right in front of you on a microphone then it's like not good and I I can see why people have that point of view. I get it. But I, I don't know. I've been making music for so long. Like that is only so interesting for so long for me. And I'm at the point now where I'm like, if I want to do some crazy vocal sounds, like I don't care if it sounds like me. I just want it to sound like how I hear it in my head. So that's fine. And I think that's like a really awesome, like world of creativity. I've opened myself and the band up to is like, I know it's me singing and it, I think it sounds like me. I've sang the song a million times and I have, you know, tons of takes of me doing the parts, but like, obviously I don't sound like the robot part in the bridge leading up to the breakdown. Like, you know, obviously that's not a person, but it's supposed to be cinematic and represent a thought I had in my head visually. And it's just, that's how I made it work. So I don't care. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, so you're confirming you're not an Android right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, at least not physically. It's the mindset, you know. He just, he just he just flips a switch. The voice turns into a vocoder. Izzy, I go ahead. Uh, what is the project you're like most proud of? Like your favorite one? Hmm. Like that I've been a part of, or just in general? Uh, just like a piece, like a song or something like that. I guess. Hmm. Oh man, that's hard. Uh, it would probably be a tie between like stuff on the heroin record and stuff on this Asking Alexandria record that I did and during COVID because they're actually both really similar or like <laughs> in, in, in the way that they came to be like heroin was like we were in this studio and everything was live and raw and real and like took forever and it was all about the vibe and everything 
and the asking record that I produced during COVID, uh, see what's on the inside. We did the same thing. Like we didn't record, we didn't MIDI anything. Like there's no like effects that aren't analog. Like we went the whole old school route with it and like set up drums and took forever and hired a live symphony orchestra and like all this shit. And it was fucking awesome. So I would say those, those are both like experience wise tied for me as you know, in terms of like the most awesome stuff I've done. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the like raw sound. Yeah. This is all straight up. That's Cool. really cool. Yeah, those are my favorites for sure. Um, I had some other questions, but Like what? <laughs> If you want to go, uh, yeah, I'll, the floor go is ahead. yours. <laughs> well, what what inspired you guys to write Genesis? Uh, so we've been actually writing demos for a while, me and Travis. Well, I've been sending him shit and he's been... telling me if it's good or not more or less and uh and he was he was into like some of the old school vibes and i was like doing that and we were like yeah cool but like i feel like i don't know maybe it was unspoken but i think we both felt that it it seemed on the surface like you know good but it wasn't really like striking i was explaining this on shane's podcast like basically there's a difference between putting yourself in the place mentally where you wrote something, which was when we wrote Dear Diary, it was, I loved emo and pop punk, but I was also part of this like up and coming underground metal hardcore scene. We all were. So, you know what I mean? Like, cause we all went to shows together and stuff. So we had these like clash of influences coming together and it created organically. That is which, Dear Diary ended up sounding like, right? So, and then you add Derek to the equation. He was just like this left field black metal fan, you know? So like, and you listen to like Cock Two Twins and stuff, which is, we had never heard of any of this stuff. So it was like injecting this weird thing into the equation, right? But so like when you come now, we're like 22, I think, as you said, years later. <laughs> and um, it's like, now when you think I'm going to do that again, I'm going to write Dear Diary songs. It feels disingenuous. That's the only way I can really explain it. So instead of trying to recreate the sound of what that record was, I had to realize that I needed to just recreate the mentality of what that record was and just update it with what my new influences are. And in... At its core, the new song is the same as Dear Diary. It's just that the influences that are thrown into the pot are updated versions, but they are of the same things. Like there is still pop punk feeling melodies in it. There's still emo things in it. There's still metal things in it. It's just that all those things have now grown for 20 years. And now we're at a more modernized version of the same mixture, more or less. Yeah. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that totally does. I had a question that bounces off of that one. So was Genesis a part of those like pandemic demos you did? You released like three songs on YouTube. And if you haven't, if anyone watching has never heard these demos, you got to go listen to them. It gave us a lot of hope in the community that from first to last would come back. But was Genesis a part of those original demos? Or is it like something that you guys are just like, let's do something different? Um... No, I wrote Genesis. The, okay, so I wrote the intro, which is just that huge like synth lead thing over the guitar chords with the crazy drums going on and everything. Hmm. I wrote that a few months ago. And this is, I hadn't sent Travis a demo in a while because honestly, my schedule goes back and forth a lot of how busy I am. Like right now I'm recording a band for the next two weeks and I've, I have like no time for... FFTL demoing stuff unfortunately I mean I wish I did but then when they're gone I'll be able to do it a bunch again and it's just been like that so he knows like sometimes you won't hear a new idea for a month or whatever right so a while ago I don't remember when but it was a few months ago I sent him that intro and I was like damn this is sick what do you think about this for FFTL and he was like 
I fucking love that. That sounds like the most like epic fucking anime intro ever. And I was like, right, exactly. <laughs> and then <clears throat> I was like, okay, sick. So then I got excited because he liked it. And to me, it felt exciting. And that was the first time I felt like genuinely excited. And I went home and I thought of the chorus melody and I was like, oh my God. And I think that same night I went back to the studio and recorded it. And I was really excited because like there's like this thing and <laughs> there's this thing in a lot of uh, anime songs because it's just something that Japanese writers do a lot that I love. And they do this thing that's like da 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 like that at the beginning yeah. of their choruses. <laughs> And I was like, I've been wanting to do that forever. And I finally got to do it. And I was like, oh, my God, I love this so much. Yes. So I, was, I, was, I was really excited about it. So that's like the main influence of what made the chorus sound the way it sounds. It's just like taking that little lead in thing that they do on the anime songs. So it all just kind of like stemmed out from there. I wasn't really planning on doing like a breakdown or anything at the end. But when I got to that point, I was like, I don't need to hear this chorus again in this form. I'm just going to do something crazy here. And I was uh, I was thinking about like that doom soundtrack like uh was that like the only thing they fear is you or whatever and i was like man i want to do some crazy because if we're already this far down like this tonal rabbit hole i was like i might as well just make the heavy part sound even more in that realm so i ended up doing that heavy part and i was like honestly this fucks pretty hard i'm just gonna stick with this and uh yeah that was that and then the ending obviously is like that crazy like end of a movie dream sequence sounding thing which I, I really like a lot too the blade runner outro really just pulls the whole song together you know yeah i love that that's probably my favorite part of the song if i'm being real I mean, it, was, it was the first teaser used so i mean i think that speaks volumes mm -hmm. heck yeah man i'll tell you the truth too that teaser when we put it out the reason it sounds different and i don't know if you noticed than the final is uh because the song was not done yet oh we put that out almost as a way to like ensure that we are actually going to finish this and make it happen. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I remember there was a leak and Travis hit me up and he was like, how did you get this? Like, did you do this? <laughs> I was just like, no, I, I, just, I found it. <laughs> and he was just like, yeah. Cause there was just like, you know, you guys wanted to finalize this. This is entirely DIY, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys are doing this yourself, so it's just like you're navigating something. You're not having a label do it for you, so you guys got to just kind of make sure you get the final product out. It wants to be like the representation of what you want, so you're going to have some differences between teasers and final product, I think. Yeah, and that's fine. I mean, dude, fucking movies do it all the time. You know how many movies have unfinished CGI in their trailers? It's insane. Right? Yeah. You, you got to have that quick Easter eye view, and I think kind of having that is just kind of reflective of that lore that just keeps building yeah. from first to last. Mm -hmm. I, I do I do have something I'd like to ask uh, to kind of piggyback off the lore and whatnot. So cool. earlier we talked about how it's a community driven like project, you know, the, the lore kind of is affected based off like what the fans and, you know, you guys come up with like almost impulsively. And, you know, with, with the anime influences and the like you said, like Doom and all that is does the kind of impulsive mentality creatively affect some of the music that you guys put out like you guys like just put something in the song because you're like oh that that sounds fun and there's almost like no deliberation to it like th and th does that happen often um it kind of depends like in this case it kind of did because when we when I first hit that nerve musically and sent it to Travis he was so pumped and then I was pumped and because like we we've, we've been like huge anime fans for a long time and i was talking about it somewhere i think it was on the crunchyroll interview or something that we did but like yeah me and travis used to watch when we were making heroin like we would like finish the day and we'd go downstairs and hang out and like riff ideas while we'd watch uh you know adult swim so we'd be watching like inuyasha and stuff like that mm -hmm. full metal alchemist and all that and he you know he's been up with it and i've been up with it and he was just like dude that's perfect like that's a, that's a great thing because like you love it i love it we can turn this into like, you know, a kind of like a, a, a theme that we can run off of because, you know, it's exciting and fresh to us and we can do new things we haven't done before, but still keep it in the realm. So I think in this case, it was kind of a mixture of both. Like it was kind of spur of the moment and out of nowhere, but it was one of those ideas that immediately clicked and then we expanded upon the implications right. of it really quickly.
but in the past i would say there's been a lot of yeah <laughs> nothing wrong with that i think that's yeah. just part of the creative process man you just you, you kind of just use what you absorb in your everyday life and i think <clears throat> that's yeah. totally normal i think more people should i think there's so much people that think that a band should just be like cut and dry it's just instruments and there's no personality we don't have interests outside of this music and it's like then how are you supposed to connect with people yeah i mean there's a there, there's a fine line between like being i guess like consistent and being like overly methodical and boring you know like there's Cause like, I don't, I appreciate that there are bands that they just keep making like for lack of a better word <laughs> or phrase the, the same record over and over again. I think that there is some merit to that because like you understand that your fans like a particular thing that you've done and they want to hear more of that. So I get it and it makes sense, but also unless I'm mistaken, almost all the bands that have ever been like, extremely significant don't really do that they make left turns and they change and they grow over time and things of you know like it i can't think of any bands that i personally love that have just made the same record over and over again i don't know of any yeah i don't i don't i'm trying to think of very successful bands that just made the same album over and over again i mean ACDC maybe but um yeah I mean I guess they would they would definitely yeah. count right yeah right? and I mean there's nothing wrong with that but I mean ACDC is ACDC mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't think we can <clears throat> find another one of those just sitting around just like yeah, yeah they did that <laughs> in that case like they're what they did was already so unique that it was like well I don't know if we're going to think of anything else this unique we already have a yeah. very unique sound as it stands so yeah maybe that's different but yeah for the most part, I mean, you're hard pressed to find bands that are like culturally significant that will like stand the test of time that just did the same formula like over and over again. And that goes all the way as far back as the Beatles. You know what I mean? So I've always appreciated that. I think it's good when you're making a record. If you are just making art for the sake of making art, it's generally just going to be different because your influences and your environment change over time. Any lead you have different opinions uh, about what is good sounding and what is interesting. And and another thing that people don't take into consideration that they probably should more often is that things inherently become less interesting once you've done them, right? Mm -hmm. So if I made Dear Diary and I'm like, this is what I think the best version of an early 2000s Screamo record is, I, I did that. So then at that point, it's like, well, what are you going to do? Make your second best interpretation of what a 2000s emo record is? You know what I mean? So uh, it gets hard, you know, because you're like, well, I already feel like I put my best ideas forward in this genre, in this exact, you know, niche of, of music, right? It's, it's yeah. weird. I, always, I just always found it weird that people will complain about from first to last changing their sound when that's kind of what you guys have always done on every album i don't think you guys have made any single or album that just sounds the same everything's always been so diverse yeah i mean it's just always some version of rock right <laughs> like yeah i mean it, yeah, yeah it all has drums it all like it's not like you guys are making uh freaking uh on a, like a music box and it's just travis screaming over like a little monkey with some symbols i mean yeah yeah maybe to 2027 i mean i've heard rumor but yeah yeah you never know anything is possible but yeah you, you know i think it's just good to be open-minded and just uh feel free to for people to express themselves creatively and not feel inhibited by expectations because like you know as People will hear that and be like, well, I want you to be like this or whatever. But I mean, if people felt inhibited by expectations, you would never have some of the most like prolific pieces of music that everyone loves. So like, here's a great example. If Mike Hem thought that way, they never would have written Black Parade. And actually, no, because I was like, you know, we used to hang out with Mikey all the time and Gerard and stuff and. Like they spent a long time on that record and it went through multiple variations of like what they thought the direction was going to be. And like, you know, I, I mean, Mikey only played bass in My Chemical Romance for, you know, 
a hot minute, but I mean, that's your brother right there, dude. He was in your band for a sec. I mean, it, there's like a celebrity wing in the alumni section of from first to last members. I mean, I think that's the most question I got for this interview was like, how the hell did y'all get Wes Borland? And I think, uh, I mean, obviously it's the Ross Robinson connection. I'm, I'm not, I mean, unless you guys just met Wes outside a gas station, you're like, dude, you playing bass right now? <laughs> no. <clears throat> yeah. The, that was just a result of, uh, we were in the studio and it was recently after splitting ways with John. Cause I think he had left the band, uh, very, pretty soon before we went to start tracking. And, uh, he, I was just, or me, either me or Travis was going to play bass and Ross was like, okay, cool. He's like, you know, if you wanted someone, I bet Wes would do it. And we're like, no, he wouldn't. <laughs> and Eddie said he would. And we we're like, what the fuck? Hell yeah. And that was that. The lore grows. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, just there's another example of just like, really? Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That took and one then, second. <laughs> and then we're like, cool. That was fucking sick. And then he's like, yeah, I'll play with you live too. And we're like, really? Okay. You know? <laughs> You're going to just cover yourself in body paint and wear underwear? Cool. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was fucking sick live. He went crazy. Oh, dude, on album live, just hella awesome. And I think um, Wes also played on the Drop Dead Gorgeous album, like, right after that, because it was the Ross Robinson connection. And it's just, like, every story I've heard, because I had Aaron Rothy on this show before, and he told me that Wes is just the nicest guy. He's just always down. He's cool. He's just... Yeah, let's play it, dude. Let's just go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude. He was an awesome. I mean, I shouldn't say was. He's still alive. <laughs> Wes, is an, <laughs> Wes is an awesome guy. He was an awesome guy to tour with, was I guess what I should have said. But yeah, um, yeah. He he's a really creative, smart, like highly intelligent, artistic person. Very fun to be around. Oh yeah. That's what's up, man. And I'm sure uh i mean the celebrity wing had mikey in it and i mean you guys have had matt manning you guys have had like a rotating door and well they... actually it was my mikey's wife alicia that yeah. played for us and then mikey would come up and play chris massacre with us because he was on tour with us for a while yeah like riding on our bus and shit because he would come visit alicia so then like she would give him the bass and he'd come out and play chris massacre at the end of the show and that that's yeah. actually what that was all about but let everybody like know Pete Wentz's phone number. Make sure that, you know, mm -hmm. call, you better call him. Pete was never in our band, though. You guys toured with him, though. Yeah. Uh -huh. I used to play. Uh, I played bass on the last song on the Fall Boy tour a bunch of times when we did that arena tour. Yeah. And you guys, I think there's video of it online. You guys trashed like a, a nice locker room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I also on... The last day of tour, there was during Pete's uh, nude leak controversy, and I came out in a giant dick costume, and it said Pete's Peter on it, and I came out and like walked behind him on stage. It was funny as shit. <laughs> yeah. It was a full-body dick costume. Wow. Was that I always planned, or was that also like, <laughs> impossible? Like, like we, we found a costume, let's do it. No, it was just like... At least back then, anyway, people used to prank each other on tour at the end okay. all the time. And I was just like, what should I do to a Fall Boy? And, like, the only thing the internet was talking about back then, because, I mean, Fall Boy was famous in a different way than they are now. They were, like, new famous. Mm -hmm. So everyone was talking about them constantly. And Pete's nudes leaked, and, you know, people were just talking about his dick pics online. And it just seemed like the, the, the best thing to do in that moment. I mean... It was great. Fun times to be had by all, I would believe. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. fucking great. Oh, yeah. I mean, so after Wes, you guys went on to do the self titled album, which I, I know, I, I know that was a tumultuous time with record labels and jumping around and stuff and, you know, a new addiction to World of Warcraft and such. <laughs> uh, but self titled is probably one of my favorite records from you guys it's like that and thrown to the wolves I, it's like for me like lyrically i feel like it applied a lot more in my adult life and i feel like you guys were probably adults by then and mm -hmm. experiencing real life stuff and as much as uh you know ride the wings of pestilence is a lyrical masterpiece i can't really apply it at my job <laughs> but i know. gotcha yeah yeah <laughs> but what was that experience like for you? Like, because I know that was like a step up from Epitaph, like recording um, 
Yeah. It, yeah. It, it felt it felt different. It did, but like I um when we made heroin, Epitaph was ready to back us to do quite literally anything at that point. Like they paid a lot of money for that record, to be honest. So um It was, you know, it did feel like a little bit more of like a big time thing, but it wasn't like an extremely huge jump. But I will say in general, when Sunny left, I was just like, well, we're obviously not going to stop because like, what else are we going to do? And like we spent, I have personally spent any other guys too, but I mean, like from a personal point of view anyway, I had spent so many years of my adult life building, which is, you know, a brand at the end of the day into this thing. And it's like, if it was any, anything really, I wouldn't just give up on it. So like we, we knew we didn't want to stop. So that was like the first thing, but then it was like, okay, well, what do we do? And then like, when it was decided, I was just going to sing. I was like, all right, cool. You know, I wasn't really sure. I guess there wasn't really like a whole lot of like examples of like that working or not working really yet. We were one of the first bands to kind of have to deal with that. And uh, I don't know, it was just kind of stressful. And then like at the same time, because we had gotten signed to Interscope, they saw, you know, the situation for what it was. And they were just like, well, we think we can still make this work, you know, but we want you guys to be more like this. And I think just because of the fact that we felt blindsided by the situation, we really just wanted to do whatever ensured our livelihood and just life in general, right? Like, I didn't want my life to change. I wanted to keep being a musician. I wanted to keep playing in the band I started in high school. I, you know, I wanted to be me, the guitar player guy in the band that I love and tour the world and all that stuff, you know, like that was my number one priority. So anyway, with some hindsight, I feel like if we had the confidence to push back in a few places here and there, I think actually the transition would have gone a little bit smoother, but because the label wanted us to just do a complete left turn i think that was probably to our detriment and i think there's a lot of six songs and self-titled and i actually like the record but i think if we had done a little bit of fan service to massage the transition a little bit better it would have helped our cause quite a bit but you know what i was like 20 early 20s then and now i'm 40 and i am a lot smarter now so um you know i can't really like live with that regret or anything it's just like you know hindsight's just serving me right now That's that's about it. But I mean, honestly, thrown to the wolves, though, that was like that was just like the result of being unhinged and not caring anymore because we had gotten fucked over through the process of making the last record felt abandoned by people in the business and in the industry by, you know, our fans, not like I shouldn't say our fans, I guess, like more of like our outside fans, like outside the core kind of people. Yeah. The outspoken minority that uh, doesn't dwell do well with change. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like the constant like heckling live and all that stuff. Like I, I had a pretty large chip on my shoulder and I think it's pretty fucking apparent on that record. I mean, and, there, uh, there is live video of you guys experiencing that. I think there's one on DVTV, uh, Matt Manning, glass inside the ass, all that. And honestly, like that's probably like one of the most unfair fair treatments anybody's probably ever gotten in the scene because i'm sure that happened more than once i'm sure that mm -hmm. was a uh slight reoccurring instance but the fact that y'all didn't just jump off stage and start just beating the shit out of people like i think you guys should give yourself a little bit of a hand for handling it and not ending up in jail or something because that's abuse that's just verbal abuse i know and berating and mean and rude for reasons that are outside your control it's like we didn't break sonny's voice twice that's not our fault that he had to go get vocal nodule surgery like he was yeah. doing that for y'all <laughs> yeah and it's just like yeah we were made to suffer for just i mean i mean suffer is a little bit hyperbolic but i you know what i mean like it just it, it just yeah i agree it wasn't really fair but it is what it is you know i can't change what happened but basically it just made us really i know me specifically like probably other guys too We grew a pretty large ship on our shoulder and then, you know, we had a lot to vent about on that record. And honestly, you know, like uh, adversity creates great art. So, I mean, I think that record's fucking sick. So it worked uh, out, I guess. Throne, I mean, if I don't, you know, people compare your, mu your new music to other bands and stuff. But uh, like for me, Genesis feels like a continuation of now that you're gone. 
and yeah. uh, war like it was like you were you were playing with that android voice of yours and it's like the footwork was there all the way back in 2010 and it's like dead trees was kind of like a detour into like a different neck of the woods to use the album art as a metaphor i guess mm -hmm. but i feel like with you being the singer again it kind of picks up where thrown to the wolves left off yeah i mean and that makes sense um Throne of the Wolves has a ton of electronic production on it. Like even in that cashing out song, like the main lead part is like half synth playing and like there's like chops in the song, like unnatural sounding chops in the middle of the song and shit like that. Like it's it's we're no I don't know. I think it's just because uh, that record is much more unknown that like the the perception is like we just decided to start doing electronics in our music out of nowhere. But like the reality is, is it was on heroin. It would have been on self-titled if I had the ability to do so, but that record is almost out of my hands. It was I mean, on Throne of the Wolves. Has ellipsis. That's like a electronic instrumental. It's kind of like you guys yeah. always had electronic elements. I mean, Dear Diary, um, I liked you before you were naked on the internet. That's you know, yeah. it's it's always been there. So I always, you know, the criticism sometimes doesn't make sense to me when it's not based in fact. They're like, they never sounded like this. And it's like, well. Why is our first EP from 2003 got electronic elements in it then? Yeah, exactly. And that, I mean, it's just like the limitations have been broken down over time. So now I can do whatever I want, which is great. And I listen to more stuff too. Um, but yeah, like, you know, like the, the even Dead Trees had a ton of electronic stuff in it. We just mixed it to be a little bit more background. But like, yeah, there's a lot on that record. I mean... For me personally, like Dead Trees and your work with Destroy Rebuild Until God Shows, like mm -hmm. there's like I solemnly swear I'm up to no good. It has like elements like Mr. Owl, which I know you had a big hand because I know uh, uh, John Feldman produced the record. I know he's pretty hands on with all his stuff and make sure like, well, this is going to be successful or whatever, whatever it is. But I feel like you just put electronic elements in all your stuff. It's kind of just like, it's part of your, it's like your signature at this point. Yeah. 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 Um, Mr. Owl, that song more or less sounds the same as the demo I brought the band with. I mean, it sounds sonically better, but we used all the programming that do -do 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 -do, the thing in the beginning, the arpeggio playing, that's literally the same sample from the demo I made in, uh, on my MacBook. I don't know. At the end of the day, people just like to, uh base opinions off of uh no information and be as strong-minded and willed about it being the truth as possible in general in the world right now and it's no different in music as it is in any other medium so i just i don't even feel affected by it anymore i've become numb to the way that people communicate on the internet because i just have been an active participant in the internet for so long and i work with so many other bands at the deal with the same shit too I get hated on by everybody all the time. And it's just like the, the new way of interacting uh, with people is just extreme love and extreme hate in the same arena, just butting heads forever. And it's extremely weird, but it's just become the norm. So I've grown to accept it. And it's like, if I, when I do look at the comments, which I truthfully don't do that much, I'll see like someone be like, Oh, you guys overproduce this as shit. And I'm like, okay like i don't know like what do you want me to take away from that like yeah I, I did i produced it a lot because that's how i want it to sound like what do you want me to say about that <laughs> but then you know, i'll see a bunch of people being like this fucking slaps fuck yeah you blah 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 and i'm like cool i mean like i don't know like as a, a sane adult human i don't know what to take away from that other than music is subjective and different people like different things and that's okay like i don't know <laughs> yeah i don't know i feel like music finds the people that want to hear it and i feel like with genesis you guys are like about a week after it dropped and you're already at a hundred thousand like a hundred thousand plus streams no record label support and you're not you know you're not on front of all press right now and it's just like it's very diy but the fact that you know a hundred thousand streams in a week like that's impressive dude like that's yeah it's that's going great yeah, i actually genuinely think it might be Quite a bit more than that now, which is sick. Yeah, it's at 153. 
There you go, man. See? Yeah, we're, we're doing pretty good. And our monthly listeners have gone up a lot, like 100,000. Yeah. So, I mean, that's great, you know? People and we got more, more stuff on the way. You know, we're not going to... People, I don't think... Uh, I, I realized this the other day. I don't know how many people have figured out from our fan base that I have actually grown to be like kind of like a prolific producer and that I have access to a studio and all these things. Like, I, I don't know how many people like are actually aware of that because um, if they knew that, I feel like people's opinions might be a little bit different. They probably expect that there's going to be more because now that like the ball is entirely in my court in terms of like, if I want to make a song, I can literally do it whenever I want to. All I have to do is just drive down the road, go to my studio and just start making stuff. You know what I mean? It's, it's not like this whole process. Like it used to be where we had to like get the budget approved by the label and book studio time. Like I could literally just go make a song and right. that's where we're at right now. And I mean, it's always the writing process for, from first to last has always kind of been you. If I'm not, if I'm wrong, I mean, I'm pretty sure Dear Diary, I think what Sonny wrote Emily and then everything else is y'all. Mm -hmm. I I believe David Lopez from the FFTL Cole asks, did you guys ever meet Emily? No. <laughs> no? <clears throat> no. I know who she is though. Yeah, see? I'm not gonna dox her, but she no. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a weird interview. It's like, all right, no Matt, we need to do <laughs> <So cool. laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to, I'm not talking like, after, I just, I don't think that she wants to be publicly known as being the girl that song was about. Yeah. And great question, David. <laughs> 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 but um, Izzy or uh, Evelyn, if you guys want to ask a question, I'm going to look through the fan questions. I know, Matt, you're a busy man. This has already been going on about an hour. I don't want to take up all your time today. If you got time for questions for fans, if that's yeah, I, I, I can do a few i can do yeah. a few um izzy evelyn you guys get yours while i get these to get these uh, questions together <laughs> izzy you want to start uh i probably have to think for a tiny second i guess <laughs> um actually now i think it's fine so you've been around like the music scene for a very long time like what do you like miss about it like from the early stages of when you were in it Hmm. Um, I think the thing I miss, yeah, probably the thing I miss most is that at the beginning, um, it was really uh, kind of like an unknown road, so to say. Uh, there was a lot of bands just kind of working entirely off of vibes, um, us being one of them. And you're just like, I don't know if this is going to work but I feel like it's cool and I feel like it's exciting, but there's no metrics. There's no data. There's no analyzing your content creation consumption. There's, you know what I mean? There's no age demos yeah. to check out that, you know, none of that stuff existed. It was just like, yeah, this feels fucking cool. And you yeah, know, yeah I, I agree. This does feel cool. And you're like, cool, fuck it. Let's do it. You know what I mean? And that was what made things happen back then. And, um, without this the social media aspect of it attached and i know that that might be a bit hypocritical because we did you know use myspace as like a springboard for our success and I, I will admit that but what myspace was then compared to what social media is now is they're they don't, yeah it's like they're so almost fun. not even relatable myspace <laughs> was just like oh yeah this is me and i have friends and that's it like there's mm -hmm. you can't like look at anything beyond that it was just like fun and silly yeah. yeah um but yeah i think that 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 would be that's definitely the thing i miss most because nowadays everything everything is down to like oh did the chorus start by this much time did the song start mm -hmm. with a hook did the and then when after that when we make our videos on tiktok do we have the hook right at the beginning mm -hmm. to you know the text hook and the bubble it's just it's so methodical that i think what it's actually doing is encouraging people less to use a creative part of their brain and use more mm -hmm. of the analytical part of the yeah. brain. And I don't know how awesome that is, like on a long yeah. term. <laughs> it's not fun. It's really not. Like my, I, I hate to mention my stuff, but <laughs> uh, like I have to post like every week when we're trying to sell a show, like 
you have to focus on numbers and all this and it gets really like stressful mm -hmm. it's yeah. just i see how like i don't really get any hate comments because like i'm not very popular with music stuff but i see how people treat newer artists and it's like crazy yeah mm -hmm. yeah like um i i don't really listen to tx2 i know you work with him mm -hmm. but i see the hate comments and i'm like wow <laughs> that's a little like much yeah just just keep scrolling like this crazy yeah i feel so <laughs> bad because evan is like such an unbelievably sweet kid mm -hmm. and he's such uh, a huge fan of all like the music that I mm -hmm. came up doing and all the bands I worked with and everything and like genuinely like he's not like faking it like he knows all the songs knows all the words mm -hmm. and he's so inspired all the time and like he has so much to offer the world like creatively and people just want to shit on him all the time but you mm -hmm. know what it doesn't really matter because for all the shit that he gets there's so many people that love him too and in a lot of ways it reminds me of us when I was young and I think I kind of like relate yeah. to him on a certain level because of that yeah well i think that's what i had to talk about i mean uh, to, to touch on that because i'm in a band the angel like expression you're in burmy with you correct yeah yeah and um it's hard because it's just a struggle it's all about consistency and it's all about performance but like i feel like numbers only really matter to labels you know, I yeah. don't think you should ever put your own personal feelings and invest in them. They're not a reflection of you. They're a reflection no. of an algorithm that managed to find a playlist that got you. And I mean, mm -hmm. for someone like, you know, Matt, like from first to last has been around for so long. Like, I mean, his band was getting spread by bulletins on MySpace. I mean, that was such yeah. a good advertising tool. They don't have that nowadays. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not a reflection of us as musicians that nobody finds our stuff. It's just like back in Matt's day, there was no algorithm. If you had 50 friends, they were going to find 50 more friends that were going to like, follow. <laughs> yeah, it's very word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I feel and... like MySpace was a different beast. I don't, I, I mean, Matt, I mean, you probably experienced MySpace and Vampire Freaks and all that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. and I don't know, how do you navigate the climate? Like, what would you say is like the biggest stark difference? Um, I mean, basically what I said earlier, like my, my space was 100% just like word of mouth. There was no algorithm. And honestly, like it wasn't even like a thing. Like you didn't see things that were um, disconnected from your own page. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. we used to get so many we were I'm not even kidding we were the first band on MySpace and the reason why is because we were all like 19 single dudes and like that's that was like a new way to meet girls was those apps and stuff it we were all single and you know emo and wanted to have girlfriends you know what I mean <laughs> so we were like on there all the time like talking to girls it was just like this new thing it was like the first version of internet e-dating sites or something in a way so we were just like, hey, we should put our band on here. And that was it. And we were just like, yeah, that's a good idea. I bet people think that's cool. <laughs> and that was before they had music pages or anything. Like it was a, a while before that. And uh, yeah. And anyway, so you didn't you didn't get like uh, suggested feeds. You know, there was no suggested mm -hmm. algorithmically driven anything. So like we used to have thousands of friend requests every day in our inbox and they were impossible to keep up with so we ended up having our friend chris like we gave him money so he could sit there and approve friend requests all day like because that's how it had to be done yeah like, it was insane otherwise these people wouldn't see your content and yeah like sonny would go on there and do bulletins and stuff and whatever but yeah it it was it was weird it was cool though like it worked really well but also, I think the main reason it works so well is because there was no, uh, well, there was a lot less people in the pool in general. Like nowadays, like because everyone can publish their music and art and everything, which is great. I think like in a world where that is norm, you kind of have to have things like as a consumer driving you to certain places otherwise you'll never find anything you like because there's just so much to weed through mm -hmm. whereas back then it was like yeah i mean i think like 20 bands a year maybe got signed you know what i mean so like it wasn't really the same vibe it was like if you listen to scene music like we were one of like 10 bands 
You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It kind of changes, like, from the consumer point of view, I guess, like, how efficient that would even be. Like, if you think about, like, MySpace now, there's no suggested thing. Like, I don't know how you'd ever have anyone find you. You should just be like, oh, I'm putting my stuff out and no one knows that I exist because I can't populate what it is that I'm doing to literally anyone else's page in any way whatsoever. So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it'd be pretty rough. I, th I think the art of the profile song has been lost. Yeah, I mean, that was cool for sure. But I mean, people put songs on their stories on Instagram and TikTok and everything, right? But it's it's all reduced to like 15, 20 seconds. And it's, yeah. it's yeah. gone the next day. And it's like, man, what was that song? Let me go check the story. It's gone. <laughs> but on, and the flip side of that, though, like you would like how it doesn't have like that a way of like algorithms of like everybody finding you. It also like limits the people that see your, your music to the people that want to like listen to that kind of music. So I imagine like the hate wasn't as bad as like, you know, for musicians nowadays where, you know, the algorithm might recommend them to someone that doesn't like them like from the get go. And now they're compelled to say something hurtful. So I think that that's also something yeah. that's for social media. Yeah. No, I mean, you're right. You're right about that. We, uh, I think most of the hate that we got was like rumors started about us like online, like in other places that, you know, that would populate like um, people would start rumors that Sonny was dead. Um, people would start rumors that people like in our families were dead, like all kinds of fucked up stuff. Like, like people, I'm not going to lie. Like for the first like year of our band, people did not like us at all. Um, it was, you know what I mean? But like, it, it that's why I was saying I kind of relate to TXD because like for everyone that was like online talking about how we should, you know, like fucking kill ourselves because we look like emo F words and all that shit. Like that was a, people are not into the effeminate guy look at that point in time. Like it was not embraced <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, anyway, but beyond that, um, yeah, for all those people, there was tons of people that love, cause we play a show and be like, damn, like 400 kids showed up tonight. And like, they knew all the words, not like some words. And I was like, damn, that's cool. But then you go online and, you know, you'd see people talking like the most horrendous shit. And you're just like, damn, what a juxtaposition. That's a really weird thing. But then eventually we just kept with it. And like eventually the people that loved us outgrew the people that hated us so much. It didn't matter anymore. I don't know. People, oh, people are just bored. People are just bored and immature, really. Yes. <laughs> Board, <laughs> board, especially. Board. Yeah, I mean that. Not to and, you know, I, I, I know Matt. You, you're a bit of a wrestling fan. I think the Miz used to have a T-shirt called "Haters Make Me Famous," and I think, I think you see that a lot more prevalently now. Like people like mm -hmm. MGK or Ronnie Radke or people who have kind of weaponized the hate to kind of benefit them to a mm -hmm. certain degree, and. I think possibly maybe, I don't know, maybe, you, I mean, you could attest to it. Maybe do you think that hate maybe helped spread the word about from first to last a little bit? Oh, I'm sure. And honestly, like I say this all the time, like if, if people aren't talking about you, then you're not, you're doing something wrong. Like I, it's just, it is the way it is. Like I see hate on everybody. Like, you know, even, even if there's objectively amazing, I'll still see hate when I'm just like, how do people like, what part of their soul do they need to reach into for this? <laughs> it's crazy. But yeah, it's just, it's just like I was saying before, it's like a part of society now and for better or for worse. I don't really know why that's the norm, but like, you know, you'll see literally anything I could find like an Olympic gymnast doing like a quadruple front flip standing on the ground. And someone would be like, yeah, but she didn't blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, <laughs> okay. Cool. I would have I, I would have stuck that landing a little better and they, yeah, yeah. he never yeah, done a just, flip in his life. <laughs> yeah, it's just like it doesn't matter. Like it, someone's always has something to say. And the reason why I don't put too much stock into it is because the few times I have actually responded to people like that, they immediately back down and like, no man, I'm actually a huge fan. I was just talking shit. <laughs> and you're like, okay. So once I realized that was the case, I was like, well, I don't need to reply to anybody doing that. Like if someone wants my attention, I will I will give it to them if they're cool, but like, I'm not going to reward people for being dicks. You know what I mean? Like, I know that's maybe in their head. They think that's like the best way to get my attention. But like, I respond to people on my Instagram uh, messages all the time and they're all nice. And I don't have any problem responding to that, but I, yeah, 
I'm not going to reward that kind of behavior, even though I know it's normal, but it just doesn't make sense to me. I, I can attest that each of you, Derek, Travis, Matt, you guys are probably one of the nicest fan dudes online in terms of like, you know, engaging with your fans in a positive manner. It's always encouraging. You guys will share on your story memes or, you know, somebody like I have this shirt from 2005. It's all falling apart, but I still have it. And it's like you guys are so warm and receptive to that. And it's just like. It's so weird that you guys get like that that visceral hate when there's a lot of love that should just be more the norm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, luckily it hasn't been. I was actually telling Travis the other day, I was like, dude, I'm so fucking happy the way the reception has been, because like the main point of criticism has been that like we added too much electronics or it's too produced or whatever. And it's not even really that many people. <laughs> and I'm just like, like the amount of hate percentage wise we've gotten is like way less than most bands I even work with. So I was like, OK, for one, great. But also before when i was saying it was just like fuck you you'll never be sunny you fucking suck and it's like oh damn that cuts way harder like this i'm like oh you think i produce a little too much it's all good man we're we're fine that's that's nothing compared to what i'm used to <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you've been uh, baptized in fire, my friend. I think that you have a tolerance for, uh, not that anyone, that, I don't think that should give anyone free reign to just like, well, like, you're not sunny. But, you know, I mean, I think you've gone through a lot to get you where you're at. And with Genesis, I think that you guys are right where you need to be. Yeah, uh, me too. And it's cool too because like the next songs like are just going to add to like the overall story uh, of like what this era is all about. And I think that like as there's more songs that come out that like paint the broader picture, I think the people that were maybe like off put by it will probably come around because they'll realize like what like we're conveying. That's the only thing that sucks about one song at a time. I actually like it because like it keeps people interested and it's something new all the time. But it's also when you're trying to like make like a new vibe and create a new like a new world building experience for your band and the lore and his fans and everything, it's hard to encapsulate all of it in one song. And I feel like Genesis is close to it, but like I am mostly just inspired by like things that feel exciting and things that feel Japanese. Like I'm just being completely honest with you. So there's a lot of things that fall into that realm. Yeah. And like, I've been listening to a shit ton of like break core music lately on YouTube. And it's just like fucking spazzed out German bass beats over like ambient synths and stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, this will probably find its way into one of our songs too. If I'm being honest, like, oh, yeah. you know, this is what it is. But like, I, yeah, I just, I have no rules set in place right now. And I think there's a lot of things that we want to, do that will add to the overall experience and people will kind of understand it more because I think most of the people that were off put by it just don't understand like why we don't sound like Dear Diary but then like once there's like a full body of work they might understand it more but if they don't that's cool too I don't really care that much I mean, if anything, you know, there's always those pandemic demos, dude. Like, I think, honestly, those songs deserve more attention. I mean, they blew up at a, you know, a nice niche full FFTL cult level. But, like, honestly, those songs, that energy, that compassion, even, like, compared alongside Genesis with even all the little audio snippets with the dialogue talking, I feel like there's good, great ideas there. And I just, I look forward to anything that you guys release, man. I I know too much about like your discog and I, 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 uh, I have like a from first to last folder in my Google Drive that has stuff that you just can't even get in America, like the Japanese bonus tracks from self-titled. And Derek's like, I've never heard those. I think I sent, <laughs> to, I sent them to Derek once. But yeah, I I'm a big avid fan of whatever you do sonically, man. And like it's not just referencing Kit Pisto because I looked it up on Wikipedia. It's because I've heard some Kit Pisto remix. <laughs> You want to know some some super deep lore that you probably don't know? What is it be, uh, that you guys got to cease and desist and that project had to stop because that no. name belongs to Star Wars? No, no, no one gave a shit about that. We were just a DJ group. You can name that whatever you want. <laughs> Why did that become um, a rumor, though? <laughs> oh, I don't know. We just stopped because I was busy producing and I was like putting all my free time into it. I was just building a new career at that point. But um, no, I was going to tell you, there's two more pandemic demos I didn't release. I know. Ooh. 
I know you said something about it. you're like I, I made like five and then you dropped three and then I was just yeah. like, your YouTube every day check it but they do exist at least versions of them exist you got like a whole album EP right there sitting in your pocket of just great stuff no 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 I mean like they're out like one of them uh it sounds a lot no no it sounds pretty different but like one of them was Hatchet and that's a song that I did with TX2 so that song uh came through as one of his songs and then there's another one uh that's called uh this is the end and that it and that one ended up getting used for this band called dragged under oh wow yeah and it's the last track on their second record so those two songs do sort of exist i mean they're different than what how i had them but they're not like wildly different oh man and i mean uh basically like your first foray back into doing vocals again like i mean you kind of took a little bit what was the feature for the word alive mm -hmm. how was that experience that's cool they just sent me a song and tell you like yo you want to do guest vocals on this and i was like yeah sure and i did it and sent it back and that was it they've been huge advocates for your return and i, I tell you the awesome way i just uh, bravo to them for cheering you on from the sidelines being like we need this yeah tell you sick he's always been a huge supporter for sure yeah great live too can't can't knock them like yeah pull it off the hell yeah yeah but, I, um i have two fan questions cool uh, yeah let's do those and then i gotta go but that's uh that's perfect of course. i don't want to take up too much of your time matt i know you guys have to do but um ethan swope asks well since now that you are the vocalist will there be vinyl repressings of self-titled and thrown to the wolves hmm. um I I mean me being the singer actually has no effect on that at all whatsoever. But um I think like that would come down to like let's see, so the Aster self-titled? Self-titled and thrown to the wolves. Self-titled is probably impossible, I guess. I would guess. Because um that was on Sure Tone. And I don't know if they have like I, I don't know, like it maybe, but probably not. And in uh, Throne of the Wolves, I'd have to like hit up Rise and be like, hey, do you guys want to do this? And you never know, maybe they would. But the Throne of the Wolves, way more likely than self titled, I would say. I, I ordered a Throne to the Wolves CD, but I forgot to put my apartment number. So I have to return to sender and get that sent back to me. But so far, the, the customer service at Rise Records has been real receptive. I'm sure you'll have more luck since you actually know people that work there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. Tone would just be a lot harder because that's like a mega corporate label. I mean, they, uh, God knows if the same management is even there, or if they were absorbed by a different company that owns a different company. Off of right, show, you know, and that that's that's why I said I wouldn't have much faith in that working out. Yeah, that's... yeah unfortunately, that, that's a problem a lot of bands go through. A lot of people from that MySpace era, there's just giant conglomerate labels that own their thing, and they're like, "Yeah, you can repress it for like three hundred thousand dollars or some." astronomical price that only a big time corp would come up with acting like this musician that toured and was a glorified homeless person probably made like ten dollars a show so they could buy a hot dog he's got the money to repress that it's it's an unfortunate circumstance that a lot of bands unfortunately share with you mm -hmm. and i think that's pretty much why we had that post hardcore like burst in like 2000 like what 14 15 where just unfortunately people were just kind of not into that scene anymore but i feel like with stuff like when we were young i feel like pandemic gave us a lot of time to reflect and remember that we were all emo kids and yeah yeah i feel like now that from first to last is back i mean you guys are coming back the same year as like drop dead gorgeous and it's just like i think it's a good time to be in good company you guys got a huge road ahead of you but i think my last question would be from gage snell he's from fftl cult he kind of has like a really long question but it's most of it was covered and i guess i can abridge it to basically saying what would a from first to last set list look like in 2024 2025 whenever this <laughs> shows or tours or like would you guys just do one album or would you pick and choose i don't know i'll leave it to you to decide huh that's actually a great question because I feel like there's a specialized set list that are popping up all over the place all the time now. Like Green Day is about to do a Dookie and American Idiot tour, like only. And uh, but I think like if you're just talking about a regular show, like we probably just play the hits. You know what I mean? Like 
that it is what it is. Like that's what I, I don't want to be the band that doesn't play the songs people want to hear. And because I I don't want to, I just saw Blink Twenty Two and they played every song I I would pretty much ever want to hear, and I left being unbelievably happy. And I just want to make sure that our fans have that same feeling of satisfaction when they leave our show. It would be whatever the set list is. It would be an egoless set list. So like if we need to play a bunch of songs of Sunny, that's completely fine. We've done it a ton of times before, and uh, that's all good. And then you know we can play. I would say most likely I would just play all the biggest songs from every record. So what would that be? You know, like Ride the Wings, Note to Self, maybe Secret Some Make Friends. Oh, the song's kind of boring live. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's about, it's like bass, you know? I mean, unless you got West there, I mean, what can you do? I mean, from Heroin, it'd probably either be one of the singles, Mother Sound or something like that. I mean, yeah, latest play. Self title, I mean, Worlds Away is one of the, like the highest played from that one, I think. Uh, yeah, that one and two is one. And then the wolves. the wolves, I mean, you guys could just throw Chia in there and, you know, you, you made all the Thrones of the Wolves fans happy and you have a 30 second breakdown in here. I think Cashing Out would actually be a good one to play live. I think that would mesh it, the, the new sound pretty well, too. Heck yeah, dude. Like, I mean, Dead Trees. I mean, probably the self. I mean, Dead Trees was the the lead single off that. That's probably the one everyone knows from that. Yeah, that's true. No, so Black and White would be sick to hear live. That song's so good. Yeah, I like Black and White. I think Never in Reverie is my favorite from that. Just that guitar solo. I, I that's one thing I will ask Mr. Matt Good of the From First to Last Guitar Mastery. We need more guitar solos in From First to Last. It's just you think so. I do. I mean, honestly, you're you're one of the best shredders out there, and it's just like, yeah, I don't know about that, but <laughs> I do have a cool and interesting style, I would say. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. I think like I'm not for our band. I'm not like super into like the standard shred vibe, so it'd have to be something. I don't know. You know I mean, out of the it... box, like Mother Sound solo was or something. I mean, just given like the current climate of things, I mean, progressive post-hardcore has such a presence out here. And I mean, you're given as an influence for a lot of guitars. I've met a lot of guitars just doing interviews or just helping bands make memes and promote. And you're up there, man. You like you're very influential. Give yourself a little credit. I mean, from first to last wouldn't exist in 1999. I mean, it was called first to last, but I mean, it wouldn't mm -hmm. exist without you, brother. Like you're. You're like the, the root, Matt Root. <laughs> if you knew how many riffs I've written for so many things. <laughs> a lot of riffs. But, um, yeah, I mean, set list, I think y'all will be fine. You can pick whatever you want. I'm pretty sure you guys could just play, like, freaking ellipsis from Aesthetic on repeat for an hour and people buy tickets and show up. We're going to have a lot of, we'll have multiple new things out by then anyway, so we can... Oh, yeah. Fill that out, man. I want to. Uh, I want to do some cool shit live. We'll have to see, but I want to do it. I mean, I guess that could be our final question. Will there be a from first to last show in two thousand twenty four? That is, I'll just say it's completely possible, but it's not predetermined yet. But I will give you with one hundred percent certainty there will be one in twenty twenty five. I mean. Shit, man, we'll do whatever we can to let like make sure people know. I mean, I'm sure Kid Bandit could use a new theme song. I mean, wrestlers go <laughs> out to theme songs; they need themes. I mean, we'll we'll share it everywhere, man. I I just appreciate the heck out of you giving you giving us your time today and just coming back. Period, because I've spent a long time just screaming at the top of my lungs in every meme form, just like I wish from first to last would come back. And I know I've seen them. <laughs> 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 and then we appreciate it oh, of course man i don't i'm pretty sure you guys were the only reason i had twitter for a while so <laughs> oh that's cool <laughs> i mean you guys are just interesting i mean you're just i mean you guys are not only like real, super friendly but you're also like really informative and you guys have a really good sense of humor i don't think i've ever seen a band troll better that's <laughs> i love to hear that that's great <laughs> I mean, think about it. you put P. Wentz's phone number in a song. I mean, every yeah. Christmas. I mean, for a while there, it, you guys would just throw a random Christmas song out. And most mm. people just know Christ Massacre. But I mean, 
uh, there's 12 X days of Christmas. There's Santa Apocalypse, which is, Yeah. I think Santa Apocalypse is my favorite just because it's got disturbed breakdown in it. It's just, that's so sick. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that one. That's so funny. <laughs> we have all those Christmas songs. <laughs> hey, holidays are coming, man. You got you got a whole set list. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we have four Christmas <laughs> songs. They're not ready. They're not ready. Yeah. I'm actually uh the one responsible for giving uh Travis the wave file for the Chris Massacre upload and the end of last year. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he Very was like, cool. Do you have this song? And I was just like Yeah, I have a wave of it. And he's like, how do you have a wave? I was just like, internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. but um, unless anyone else has anything else they want to ask or say. Nobody? Well, That's pretty good. yeah. <laughs> nice, cool. <laughs> We Over appreciate here. your Yeah. time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. It was a pleasure being on here and talking to you all. And I hope that you have a fantastic Sunday, Sunday, and It's Sunday, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. Praise the Lord, uh, Skeletor. Yeah, long live Skeletor. He never, he'll ne his light will never go out. And apparently, according to Travis, that that Skeletor represents the spirit of from first to last. I think that was the tweet, what the tweet said once. And I guess that's that's about the only logic that makes sense. Battery just really likes He Man. I like it. I like it. I I think think that's he's great. a good mascot. He, he's been with the band for a while. He's he put the work in. I think it's time to put him on stage. Yeah. Yep. Skeletor is the bass player, if anyone asks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's perfect. awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matt Good, for coming on Warp Taste Podcast today. Uh, a special thanks to New Fury Media, Young and Aspiring, Ghost Killer Entertainment, Math Rock Memes, and Heretic Promotions for helping out promote this episode in the future. Um... Thanks again, Matt. Sincerely, I appreciate your time, man. Yeah, no problem, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Very cool. Everybody have a good day.